Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, part two of the RSET humanitarian applications using NASA Earth observations training. Um, today, we are talking about uh, our, our part of the training focuses on mapping refugee settlement growth and population change. Um, as a reminder, um, this is, this webinar series is scheduled around World Refugee Day, which takes place on June 20th, 2022. We've got four parts that are distributed sort of before and after World Refugee Day and, and really are focused on um, refugees one way or the other, uh, or humanitarian concerns of refugees rather. Um, in our last part of our training, we looked at monitoring urban damage with INSAR, with um, interferometric SAR analysis. That uh, part of the training um, is sort of positioned to think about how we can use satellite data um, to map the spatial pattern and the, the events, detect the events that cause people um, to be displaced from their home. So uh, in this case, uh, armed, large scale armed conflict. Um, today in part two, we're talking about, we're coming at sort of the end of that displacement or at least a stage after that initial displacement where we're focused on the refugee settlements and looking at the growth and population change uh, using satellite data um, uh, that, that occur. Um, part three is really a, a follow-on to part two where we're looking at um, more focusing on the agricultural and vegetation changes in particular um, in and surrounding the refugee settlements. And then part four um, wraps up our uh, training by looking at um, climate hazards at refugee camps. So really thinking if part two and three is sort of a bottom-up, let's look at the vegetative condition, let's look at the infrastructure at the settlement, and we detect that from space. Part four is rather thinking about, let's look at these top-down climatic um, conditions that, that may affect uh, refugee uh, vulnerability in, in refugee camps. Um, each part of this training is two hours long, and that includes a question and answer session at the conclusion. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing your questions at the end of this. Uh, part of the training. Uh, and again, we're focused just today on this refugee settlement growth and population change. So this uh, part of the training is really motivated from the fact that refugee settlements rapidly grow following refugee arrival. We often have thousands of refugees um, showing up uh, within a matter of weeks, sometimes more. Um, and that can really, that large scale population arrival um, in an in a settlement uh, that the settlement usually doesn't exist, right, before the refugee uh, need to create that settlement has been identified. So that settlement gets established, uh, it, it often expands very quickly, um, and then the population uh, arrival comes very, the population uh, increases very quickly with refugee arrivals. Those dynamics constrain available resources and existing infrastructure um, and there, the situation is often is such a, it's often referred to as a rapid response situation. So there's lots of attention, acute attention to setting up the settlement, to providing the aid, the need, the, the addressing different kinds of needs, such as shelter and medicine, um, to the incoming refugees. And um, those, those kind of processes uh, ha can have a uh, visual impact on the landscape, right? We can see indications of this. Um, in the refugee layout and settlement layout. And so satellite data, because there's that um, kind of spatial indicator, the, the, the hallmark of the settlement establishment, the expansion and the population arrival, um, satellite data have a, a really great um, spot to play in detecting that timing, the rate of settlement change and supporting the refugee population uh, within the settlement. And we'll be looking at some of the different, uh, through our case study, we'll be looking at some of the examples of doing that. So today, um, our goals, we wanna look at land cover changes following refugee settlement establishment, and we'll be doing that through visual as well as quantitative analysis. And um, that, that emphasis on visual um, is, is intentional because um, we can, interpret these images often um, in, a, in a more perhaps efficient or rapid way than we could through uh, analyzing things in a quantitative way, um, at least in a single image. Um, and having that visual reference is really important so that when we do run a quanti quantitative analysis, we're not 
uh, we, we have a way of, of comparing that to make sure that it lines up with how we actually see uh, things changing through our own uh, interpretation of the imagery using our own remote sensing system, which is our eyes and our brain. Um, we also are going to uh, map this uh, rapid expansion of refugee settlements using uh, satellite time series data. So um, looking at many, many, many images, um, dozens collected over several years. And we'll be looking at um, some of the leading uh, satellite data informed demographic products, things like mapping population density over a raster grid um, in a given region, which includes a refugee settlement. And we'll be looking at how well those do and comparing those uh, estimates to some of the official uh, population data provided by the UN Refugee Agency. Um, my name is Jamin Vandenhoek. I've been speaking to you so far. I'm an Associate Professor of Geography at Oregon State University. Um, I will be walking us through the background and, and framing of this part of the training, and then I'll hand it off to uh, Hannah Friedrich, who will walk us through the case study. Uh, and Hannah is a PhD student of geography at the University of Arizona. Today's case studies are uh, each done using uh, Google Earth Engine. So if you haven't already, head over to the Earth Engine site. We have a link there in the slide um, and click sign up and get going with your own account. The links that we'll be sharing that Hannah will be introducing um, should uh, persist. So anytime, if you don't have your training, if you don't have your account set up today, you can come back to the recording of the training at another time and, uh, and walk through the, the uh, case study uh, at your own pace once you do have an account. Um, there are several RSET uh, trainings that we're um, kind of building off of. Um, we have at least five I, that, that really are, uh, would offer a nice sort of um, uh, precedence for some of the things we'll be talking about today. The fundamentals of remote sensing training, the um, Google Earth Engine for land monitoring applications, the land degradation, uh, training, uh, the population grids training, as well as the time series. So um, not uh, necessary that you've gone through all five trainings for this, but just calling these out as uh, really good resources um, to help perhaps lay a better foundation, a uh, more complete foundation um, for what we will be talking about today. Okay, so um, why do we need to understand refugee settlement dynamics and how can NASA satellite data help um, well, why do we need to understand it? Um, one reason is that it's a really large, complex problem, uh, that of refugee um, population displacements around the world. Um, at the end of 2021, we had about 26 million refugees across almost every country in the world, 170 of uh, 195 countries. Um, this is a global phenomenon. It's a uh, we can't even say it's a yearly phenomenon. In some cases, there are new displacements occurring every month. Um, and uh, this really um, merits much more attention than it's receiving. These uh, needs of refugees are consistently undermet. Um, there's really never enough money or enough um, aid, enough support to address all these needs. So it's sort of um, a scenario where we're always um, trying to address humanitarian concerns with far fewer resources than are actually needed to do so. So it's a really large-scale problem. Um, and this, before we get much further, just to clarify um, this term refugee, this is a properly uh, you know, defined term um, as someone who is an international migrant, so someone who has to have crossed uh, international borders who has been forcibly displaced from their home uh, country due to violence or persecution or the threat thereof. Um, and they've been granted under, uh, sorry, granted protection under international law. Um, so this, this distinguishes refugees from internally displaced um, populations, IDPs. Um, this uh, international uh, crossing has to take place and there has to be a request for asylum. As you may expect, then when you cross that border, um, most times um, refugees then seek asylum in their one of their neighboring countries. So we end up um, seeing uh, the vast majority of, of neighboring countries um, 
that are neighboring where the refugees are being displaced from really um, shouldering a lot of the, the responsibility for supporting those refugees over, in some cases, um, decades. Um, so here we have two examples of uh, different moments of uh, sort of South Sudanese refugee arrivals. Um, there are about 2.2 million refugees um, today from South Sudan, and they are broadly living in um, Kenya and Uganda. Um, so with that uh, neighboring country displacement or the, the reception of refugees in neighboring countries uh, that, that correlates to um, developing countries hosting most of the world's refugee population, 86%. And this has its own set of challenges because uh, many of the developing countries um, that end up hosting refugees, um, not only do they not receive enough support from international donors to uh, as much as they've requested, to support refugee needs, often they're all. Uh, the, some of the countries are already um, dealing with some extreme uh, resource scarcity of their own, um, and so we have some of the uh, most sort of critical refugee um, scenarios um, that kind of go on without being um, addressed uh, as they need to, just simply because of the lack of available resources. Um, challenging that. Uh, the population continues to rise. Since 2010, the global forcibly displaced population has doubled. And with that doubling over time, um, we also have uh, a, um, it varies year to year, but um, there's a often quite a long average period um, that refugees are displaced. Um, in fact, two out of three refugees are in what's called a protracted refugee situation. And that's when you have 25,000 or more refugees from the same nationality who have been in exile for five consecutive years or more in a given uh, host country or asylum country. Um, so this is, this is common. Um, this, is, this is the most common scenario that we have these long-term displacements. These are not short-term, uh, a couple of weeks or even a couple of years, the, the, the tend the trend um, is many years, and in some, case, some cases, we see um, settlements inhabited for generations. Children uh, born as, as refugees. Last year, uh, there were a million refugee children born. Um, and so we have this rising population over time, and that uh, really since you know, uh, the, the modern definition of refugees was, in, was created, um, that's always outpaced the number of returnees, the number of refugees who go back home um, to their home country. So we have this widening gap, and we also have a general uh, between refugees and returnees, and we also have um, just this growing population, at least over the last decade or so. So it's a sizable problem, um, and the, U the UN... Uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, which we abbreviate as UNHCR, that's the UN Refugee Agency. They shelter uh, and, and really help manage nearly a third of global refugees in um, refugee settlements. Settlements get, um, when we talk about a refugee settlement, then this is not um, a refugee living or moving into an existing city. These settlements are established for refugees. Their plot of land is allocated. Um, it's it's uh, it's planned. Um, there are estimates of how many refugees can be in a given refugee settlement at a given time. What kind of infrastructure is needed to support that? On the right hand side of this image, we see um, a, a couple of different way, a couple of different examples of um, refugee settlement uh, dwellings or structures. Rather, we have an emergency shelter, a transitional shelter, um, and we have a kind of the, the planning. Um, uh, layout on the right hand side where you can see individual um, tracts and dwelling units sort of allocated within. So this is highly organized in, in many cases, highly organized um, and responsive to the need to shelter so many refugees. Um, but this takes place on land, right? This takes place, this is, you could think of this as novel urbanization. So that's where uh, satellite remote sensing comes in. You can see the top uh, image, the aerial view of the, in the upper left image in the graphic. Um, that aerial view is really telling. We can do things like count dwellings. We can map the road infrastructure. We can look at vegetation dynamics. Um, lots of things, right, um, that we can get at from 
uh, well, that's an aerial view, but from a satellite view, we can we can get some of the similar kinds of information. Um, so though this is an, uh, you know, extremely uh, often considered an, uh, an extreme social concern, there's a lot we can do with satellite data um, to address this. And, and it's pretty self-evident, right? When we look at some of these settlements on the right-hand side, this is a, a time series video of uh, Sentinel-2 data um, over actually one of the settlements we'll be talking about today in uh, Uganda. Um, this is this kind of change we see with the urbanization, sorry, with the infrastructural development, um, with the clearing of vegetation, with the establishment of dwellings, you can see some of the bright structures there as well, um, some of the larger um, buildings. This is occurring over the, a matter of months. Um, so this, this, this is a new settlement that's established. Um, and, uh, you know, here we are uh, six years later and it's still inhabited. Um, and there's not necessarily much indication that it's going to be closed and the refugee population that's living there now would, would return. Um, so we can see this really well in the satellite data. Um, and we can, in particular, track how quickly this happens, right? Um, this rapid establishment. Um, we can see that really well with our eyes and we'll be looking at today um, how we can use some quantitative assessments as well to support that. Um, there is quite a diversity of uh, layouts of refugee uh, settlements or sometimes they're called camps. Um, broadly, we could think about these as sort of being in an unplanned category or one you could consider being an organically settled um, settlement versus one that's planned. And the general distinction would be that one has a uh, more of a rectilinear sort of 90 degree uh, roads on the right hand side of the plan compared to the um, the more sort of diffusely distributed uh, dwellings um, on the left. Um, but they're both uh, refugee, uh, different kinds of refugee settlements um, and they uh, have different kinds of challenges from a remote sensing perspective. We have different kinds of density of structures, vegetation intermixing, uh, on the right-hand side, you could say there's a bit more of a, a pattern that we can see um, uh, in terms of the arrangement of dwellings um, and allocated land compared to the left, which is uh, we don't necessarily see that sort of um, clustering. Um, so different kinds of challenges, right, um, between uh, looking at, in a sense, this gradient from unplanned to planned. Um, and um, we also have extreme um, diversity, right, across different settlements. We have a large population living in camps, um, some very well-known camps like Zatri on the left and Kutupalong, uh, Bangladesh, um, where uh, uh, Rohingya uh, refugees are in this uh, Kutupalong camp, whereas Syrian refugees are in this uh, Zatri camp. Um, but look at how different these are, right? Completely different um, kind of layout, the terrain, we have hilly, uh, terraced lands with um, with shelters and dwellings and other kind of buildings um, kind of built in, nestled into these terraces. Um, totally different layout in um, this uh, Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. Um, and that's not even to speak about all the different kind of environmental and climatic conditions, just the layout of these camps themselves, uh, extremely different. Um, so one of the consequences of uh, no, not only do we see um, a lot of variability um, on in terms of the layout of refugee settlements, um, we also have uh, something that's sort of challenging some of the overarching uh, concerns about responding to refugee needs is we have um, in some cases some very restrictive warehousing policies that restrict uh, that, that limit refugee mobility so that they um, can't leave the refugee camp in some cases. Um, these are called yeah, warehousing policies. Where countries um, are engaged in warehousing policies, that's a really good predictor of protraction, how long a refugee, refugees will stay in a given country. Um, and that has that rest those restrictions on mobility um, have effects for refugees developing their own livelihoods, for generating their own income, for um, leaving the camp for any sort of uh, uh, wage-seeking be, uh, behavior. Um, and uh, this is an estimate on the right-hand side here of, uh, this is very old, but it's the, the most recent um, 
uh, estimate of populate country level population that I could find, um, showing the number of, of refugees in these different kinds of scenarios. So these population data are surely out of date, but just to give an example of the number of countries that have um, these kinds of restrictive policies, um, this means that the settlement in these cases really is one of the uh, key, key places to study um, to understand the kind of uh, concerns and needs of refugees because um, refugees are restricted to that settlement, right, because of these warehousing policies. So I've mentioned a couple of these advantages of satellite data um, for monitoring humanitarian conditions of refugee settlements. A, a big one, an obvious one that I haven't mentioned is that uh, satellites can see, you know, anywhere around the globe. Um, we are not limited by uh, physical access or the need for physical access um, or the remoteness of a given location, which is common. Um, many borderlands sort of settings for refugee communities. Um, we have uh, satellites in orbit that are detecting uh, images, uh, sorry, gathering images anywhere around the world, regardless of our ability to actually visit those sites. That, of course, has its own challenges. We have to make sure our assessment is is well grounded. But um, at least we have we have imagery. We have some data that we can work with. Um, we also have this broad coverage. We can look at uh, conditions across an entire refugee hosting country, for example, and compare and contrast between countries because we have consistent acquisitions. Um, from a given sensor over time, Landsat is going to collect the same kind of data uh, day after day, site after site, um, and uh, you know most satellites uh, we we could say the same thing. We have that consistency um, that allows us to measure uh, the same kind of signal over broad expanse um, and over long periods of time. Um, we also have this repeat, um, what we, we could call a revisit from satellites that give us a in some cases near real time assessment um, and we that can go into perpetuity and in the case of Landsat that can take us back uh, decades as well which is a, a huge advantage. Satellite data as you all know really flexible um, they can be applied in in many different kinds of directions um, it's really just limited to um, our creativity and our imagination, and I think some of the awareness of what what uh, needs to be done. Right, there's a gap between what needs to be done and the data that might be available to do it. And so that's one of the reasons that motivated this this training as well is to think about how we can narrow that gap to make to take advantage of this uh, kind of flexibility of satellite data and put them into a humanitarian application, which which is uh, may not be one of the most common kinds of application. Um, we also, though we have this broad expanse and long, uh, you know, we can look at huge areas over time. Um, the data doesn't mean it doesn't mean that those satellite data are um, out of context and, and sort of irrelevant to the local conditions. It's it's in fact just the opposite. We can really localize some insights on refugee uh, livelihoods or things like sustainable development or disaster risk reduction, climate adaptation. Um, even though we're getting this really broad view from satellites we can the, the view that we're really interested in is what's happening at the settlement or around the settlement um, and satellites of course are, are terrific at uh, offering that kind of perspective so uh, satellite data have been used for uh, a diversity of different refugee settlement mapping applications uh, for at least a couple of decades in uh, peer-reviewed literature um, some of these early uh, studies focused on counting dwellings or establishing refugee settlement um, boundaries, estimating the extent, the footprint of the refugee settlement um, using satellite data. Um, we can see an example of this on the right-hand side, looking at uh, the tracking uh, the growth of refugee settlement um, over time. This remains a really common application just because the need is, it's still there. We, we the, the, satellite imagery give us this insight into this rapid expansion of, of the settlement and we can get at that we can track that in part through counting um, dwellings through uh, counting the uh, estimating the area of the, the satellite of the settlement and then correlating that to um, to population density um, some uh, studies use uh, before and after snapshots to narrate the settlement growth um, and estimate the population. Um, other studies 
um, take advantage of multi-temporal or full time series, which is to say all available imagery um, from a given satellite sensor to map settlement expansion or um, land use and land cover changes. And there's uh, really a, a amazing diversity of different uh, applications around these. So there's surely more than what we have uh, listed here, but these are some of the ones that are most relevant for this training today. Um, uh, so there's lots of great precedent to, to build on and uh, of course lots of opportunities for improvement going forward. Um, throughout all of these studies, right, decades of this kind of work, there are several challenges to monitoring refugee settlement dynamics that really persist. Um, they're characteristics of the settlement um, and the, the sort of habitation, this long-term habitation um, that are difficult to, to totally uh, overcome. Um, the first is that refugee settlements um, and the land use within a settlement, they tend to be pretty small scale. So sometimes we may see a plot of land um, within a refugee settlement that's smaller than a Landsat pixel, or perhaps smaller than a 30 meter by 30 meter Landsat pixel, or perhaps um, may just take up one, say Sentinel-2, 10 meter by 10 meter pixel, right? These can be really small plots of land. Um, those are difficult to detect using open data. So high resolution data um, can be uh, really helpful in those cases. Um, we also tend to have a, um, we don't, it, it's not a sort of a typical um, city layout where it's just dwelling after dwelling after dwelling in a dense, you know, urbanized area. Often we see vegetation um, intermixed or often we see bare earth intermixed in between these dwellings. Um, that creates challenges from a, a mixed pixel phenomenon where we, uh, that makes it difficult to get a clean signal in some cases of individual dwellings or infrastructure. Um, and so we sort of have a muddled classification or, or uh, on the flip side, characterization of vegetation condition because the dwellings are getting in the way or infrastructure of our vegetation assessment. Um, and of course I mentioned this one, but because the refugee settlements are so rapidly often um, built and settled, um, we have this, um, this uh, need for very high frequency revisit data to capture um, that kind of uh, dynamic. Um, and we also don't have uh, a, once the settlement is open, the settlement may close um, at some later time. So we have this sort of different kinds of temporal concerns, both the rapidity of it, but also the ephemerality in some cases uh, of settlements opening and then closing at, at another time. And really all of this really necessitates um, knowing what's happening in a specific um, displacement context. We need to know um, the timing of the settlement establishment. We need to know if it's been closed, of course. Um, so we, we can't just be operating um, outside of this uh, kind of knowledge of the actual um, the conditions on the ground. As much as we can, we want to understand those before designing our satellite image analysis. Um, there's also generally a, a scarcity of up-to-date data on land cover land use changes in refugee settlements. So that can make it difficult to validate some of our assessments uh, sim similarly with population dynamics. Um, so uh, often we, we don't quite have the kind of data we'd really like um, to refer to, to to make sure we're accurately capturing a land cover land use change uh, at the specifics that we're interested in. And so we can use other kind of data that are available, maybe collected elsewhere in the same region that would have a similar kind of uh, value for assessing what um, a given kind of vegetation looks like spectrally, and then we can check it that way. But suffice it to say that we may not have that opportunity for ground truth data right at the site of the settlement itself. Um, and we'll be dealing with some of these in our uh, training today. Um, that's all for me. I'm going to hand it over to Hannah for our case study. Great. Uh, thanks, Jamin. Um, so now we're going to shift into uh, kind of the case study portion of, of this training. Um, and we'll specifically be looking at the establishment of refugee settlements in Uganda. Yeah. Um, but before doing that, um, I'm going to give a little bit kind of more background and context on why there's refugee settlements in Uganda and kind of the, the history of um, how those came to be. So currently the total refugee population in Uganda is about 1.4 million, um, which makes Uganda about the third largest 
refugee hosting country in the world, um, which is pretty staggering with primarily most of the refugee population is coming from South Sudan, um, as well as Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and kind of refugee settlements in, in Uganda in general have really date back to the 1960s um, when there were refugees from Burundi and Rwanda um, and DRC that first began to um, be resettled within settlements in Uganda. Um, and the history of kind of how Uganda has managed or welcomed refugees has changed a lot, um, especially in the past 20 years, where um, Jamin mentioned earlier in the in the training that there were, you know, these warehousing policies where there's really restrictions on what refugees can do and where they can be and if they can leave settlements or not. But um, in the past, really since the 2010s, Uganda has kind of pioneered this self-reliance or self-sufficiency policy of really having an open door um, policy when it comes to what refugees can can do. So um, within a settlement, refugees are, are settled. Um, they're given a plot of land um, for a dwelling and agriculture um, and really significantly granted access to services such as healthcare, education, and freedom of movement to come and go from the settlement as they please. So um, this really, you know, is, opens up a lot of kind of doors and opportunities for people to gain employment, you know, be able to go to school, get the services that they that they need, um, which refugees in other refugee hosting countries aren't able to take advantage of. So um, in that sense, Uganda has kind of had this really liberal refugee response policy that has been widely praised within the the international refugee kind of hosting community um and also has implications for how we think about what refugees what refugee settlements look like in satellite imagery um knowing that there's not necessarily a hard boundary when it comes to understanding where there's built up areas um in locations that that refugees are settled um and so in total there's 32 unit TR managed uh, refugee settlements uh, across Uganda. Uh, in this map here on the right hand side, you can see that um, the refugee settlements themselves here are, are outlined, are filled in in orange, and they're kind of dispersed in the northern part of the country as well as the western um, span of, of Uganda. And so um, in the northern part, there's quite a few that are really clustered together. Um, and they're a little bit more spread out in the western part. But um, what's kind of interesting about the spatial distribution and, and also like extent of, of settlements is that some of them can be really large. So for example, Bidi Bidi, um, which is in the right hand kind of, or sorry, upper left hand part of this map in set A is one of the largest refugee settlements in the world and is really giant boundary extent. Um, but then there's some refugee settlements um, like Pajarina, which is one that we'll be looking at more in depth in this in this training, but ones like Alua 1 and Alua 2, which are really, really tiny. Um, and so the variability in the size of refugee settlements um, also, you know, kind of adds another element of complexity to understanding what refugee settlements look like in in a given locale, given you know the different um, layouts that that can that are possible. So, um, if we look on the left hand side here, there's also a, a timeline of the total Re Ugandan refugee population through time, and so the population totals date back to the 1960s, which is when the first refugee settlement was opened in Uganda, but we see here kind of in the 2014-2015 um, at that point we see this really explosion in the refugee population um, and that's due to conflict that was happening um, in South Sudan with the civil war that was happening where about a million refugees from South, South Sudan um, were displaced to Uganda. So um, Jamin mentioned that 
in in refugee settlements, there's usually a rapid expansion of you know the the settlement being established, and then also with populations being arriving at the settlement, this kind of rapid um, urbanization that can occur. So even just looking at the the timeline of of total population, we see this kind of at large influx of of people coming in um, to Uganda. Um, so this these three images here are actually just showing Google base map, but um, show three different examples of some of these smaller settlements in Uganda, um, but also kind of show the, the diversity that can exist. So in Ailo 1, we kind of see this gridded street network um, in these two kind of sections of the settlement itself. Um, and a little bit of that is also present here in this middle figure of Baroli one. And then looking at um, Mary, the one on the right hand side, this is a bit more organic. Um, you know, there's less of a, um, you know, grid-like layout to the, the streets themselves. It's mostly just like walking paths in between these smaller clusters of dwellings or structures. So, um, yeah, the, having a kind of a, you know, knowing the diversity that can exist with, with refugee settlement layout is, is really important and kind of, I think, will set us up for going into where we're about to go with the training here. Um, so for kind of for the remainder of the, the training, we'll be focusing on just one settlement called Pajarina that was established in 2016. And this is one of the handful of settlements that was established to uh, host the arriving refugees from South Sudan. Um, so Pajarina mainly hosts, um, the population is, is majority um, South Sudanese. Um, the kind of, I think the cap that it was at, the, the total population there's about 36,000. Um, so within this blue unit here settlement boundary, um, there's about 36,000 South Sudanese that were, were settled here. Um, so it's in located in the northern part of the country. Um, and um, one kind of side note here about where these unit share settlement boundaries come from, um, they usually result from planners on the ground working with um, within UNHCR to set up the settlement, um, and then the geospatial <laughs> officers get, um, you know, create the data set and that's shared. Um, and that data set is also shared with uh, the humanitarian open street map team. Um, and so they, you can access these settlement boundaries through open street map. Um, and there's also a platform called Humanitarian Data Exchange, which hosts a lot of um, humanitarian open street map data, including the settlement boundaries. So um, yeah, the, the UNHCR settlement boundaries aren't always as easily available for other refugee hosting countries, but um, in the case of Uganda, they're quite easy to, to access publicly. Um, so in this middle map, I also have some additional OSM data here showing the official road network, um, as well as just some points of interest, including refugee response offices and market centers. Um, and there's a, a host of other types of landscape features that are available through OSM, um, which is also kind of really interesting for kind of grounding us for understanding what kind of services and, um, you know, things like schools or child-friendly spaces, um, markets, um, exist at these, at these settlements. Um, and then the map on the right-hand side is a land cover map from the European Space Agency, their 2020 world cover map. Um, and which we'll get into in the training three of this um, kind of training series, a little bit more into comparing different land covers, but we can see here that um, even though Pajarina was established in 2016 and this data set from ESA represents 2020, nominally the, the land cover there 
there's a lot of built up area that's missing um, and a large portion of the settlement has been classified as cropland or grassland. And even though it's picking up a little bit of this street network here with like this thin red lines, there's still a lot of, you know, residential dwellings and structures that are just completely missing from, from these kind of off the shelf land cover products. So this kind of begs the question of how can we kind of understand essentially map urban urban built up area um, on our own using um, available satellite imagery. So we're going to start with first just visualizing um, Pajarin itself. So the we'll make a time series looking at the establishment of the settlement. Um, and then as we'll see here, we'll be making this kind of little GIF on the right hand side the pretty rapid expansion that happens at Pajarina. Um, so we'll be using Landsat 8, uh, so a 30 meter um, optical sensor and creating a time series from 2015 through 2020 um, to capture the establishment of Pajarina, which happens in middle of 2016. So I'm going to click on this Earth Engine link and it's gonna pop us over um, into code editor. So um, here it, we are in Earth Engine. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, I'm just gonna do a really quick overview just to situate what, um, what we're looking at. So this is the, the code editor of Earth Engine. Um, on the right hand side, there's tabs for your scripts, um, docs, so this is, you know, if you need to look up um, information about any of the functions that we'll be using in the script itself, this allows you to come and search through that, um, as well as a tab for assets, which has um, essentially where you store your data that you personally upload to Earth Engine that you can use and share with others so they can use it as well. Um, in the middle here, we have our code editor, which is where we have our script ourself, which we can edit, um, comment, add code to, um, and this is what we'll be walking through here in a second. Um, we can search for existing data sets within the Earth Engine catalog in the search tab here. Um, so there's a just almost endless amount of data sets that are there and being added all the time. So um, this is kind of a, a jumping off place for looking for additional satellite imagery or different data sets that are hosted on Earth Engine. Um, and then here on the right hand side is the console. So this is where we'll be, if we're printing things out, um, how we'll be interacting with those, um, that information that's printed out. Um, there's also an inspector tab, which we'll use in a little bit um, to click on the map below here and look at some data values and kind of interact with the data that we're creating uh, a little bit more intimately. Um, and then here, really the, the links or the buttons that you'll want to pay attention to here is just this run button. So as we're editing the script um, and want to output it, we'll hit run and that will allow us to um, run our script. So, um, we're going to start out here um, uh, first setting our options for our map. So our map is down below here. Um, you can have either a map that you would think of when you think of a Google Maps or something. So that has the political labels, streets, um, you know, some of the road network, waterways on there. But we're going to set our options to satellite um, that just switches it over to the Google base map there. Even though we'll be adding satellite imagery on top of this, um, it's just a little bit easy to kind of understand and interact with um, the underlying base map there. So first, we're going to load in the unit to our settlement boundary for Pajarina, um, which is shared publicly as an asset um, within this repository called EERSET Humanitarian. Um, and so we'll load it in as a feature collection, but because it's just a single 
feature within the feature collection. Um, we're going to use this dot first to grab that feature um, and call it a feature. So in Earth Engine, um, if you've done the some of the RSET primers on this, there's these different types of data on um, feature collections as well as features. A feature is essentially just a single item within a feature collection. Um, so we're that's why we're kind of calling this here um, after we filter this here. So we're going to create that variable called Pajarina, and then we're going to add it to the map. Um, so we're adding the feature Pajarina. We're not giving it any visualization and calling it Pajarina Refugee Settlement as the layer name. Um, and then we'll also center the object on Pajarina. So this will, even if we pan over here and get off of Pajarina, whenever we run the script, it will automatically bring us back to centering the map on Pajarina itself, um, which is pretty handy. Um, so while the, the settlement boundary is really useful, um, we really kind of want to be interacting or looking at what's also happening on the periphery and the edges of the settlement. So we're going to create a buffer around the settlement um, just to kind of bound what we're looking at. So um, we're going to create a buffer of 500 meters. Um, buffers in Earth Engine operate in meters. Um, and then we're going to apply this buffer of 500 to Pajarina and then create a bounds on it and create um, force it to become a geometry in Earth Engine speak. So this is essentially going to be a, a bounds or bounding box around Pajarina itself. Um, so that's a little bit of kind of just the, the prep work to get uh, working with our boundary. Um, and before we get into working with Landsat data itself, um, we're going to create a function to add indices. So um, with Landsat data, we have multispectral optical imagery. Um, and for visualizing some of the, the changes in refugee settlements over time, um, we could just look at true color, red, green, blue imagery, or false color imagery. But we could also apply indices like the normalized difference vegetation index, um, which essentially allows us to see how green each pixel is, or the normalized difference built-up index to evaluate the essentially the degree of built-upness or urban urbanization of a pixel, um, or something like the normalized burn ratio um, to evaluate uh, burned area. So um, this function itself is um, really just taking what bands will want to create those indices with um, and use a function called normalize difference um, to create those um, unique indices. So for NDVI, we're going to be taking mu infrared minus red divided by mu infrared plus red. Um, and we'll be doing that um, for different bands for NDVI and NBR. Um, uh, some other prep work we're going to do before kind of loading our image collection for Landsat is renaming our bands. So um, the Landsat images come served up um, with the bands. We'll be using the, the surface reflectance version of Landsat, but the bands are called SR underscore B2, which is not super intuitive for <laughs> understanding or knowing which bands those are. So we'll rename them to blue, green, red near thread, swear one and swear two. Um, so to actually um, process our, our Landsat data at Pajarina, um, we're going to take the image collection itself, um, which is um, the string here. And we can also go in here, and I'm just copying and pasting that string and pulling this up so we can read a little bit more. You can go into the description. See the bands. Here's our SR underscore B1. See where all the image properties are. Um, so this is the image collection that we're loading in. And then we'll be taking that, filtering it to the dates of 2015 through 2020. Um, given that that's our, our period of interest around the establishment date, 
um, and then filtering it to these buffered bounds that we created earlier, which is the bounding box around Padrina. Um, we'll also want to get rid of images that have a lot of cloud cover. So we're going to filter the image collection to have images that have cloud cover less than 40%. Um, so this filter uh, function allows us to filter by image property. Um, so we'll be getting rid of cloudy imagery um, more or less with this, this filter command. Um, and then we're going to rename our bands. So we have these two lists here that we created before. Um, we'll, we'll be selecting our bands of interest, these SR underscore bands, and renaming them to our more interpretable um, blue, green, red, uh, et cetera, named bands. And then lastly, we're going to take that function that we created before called add indices, um, where we take our various bands that we want to create indices with and actually create the indices and add them to each image. Um, so this will allow us then to have a full image collection at Pajarina from 2015 through 2020, um, with each image having NDVI, NDBI, as well as NBR um, as bands. So that will that will uh, set up our image collection. Um, next, um, so we could just add our uh, refugee settlement boundary to the map, but a handy dandy little um, way to just add the outline is to create an empty image um, and paint the Pajarina outline onto the image with a couple of parameters saying the width of the boundary itself and the color. Um, and then we'll add that outline um, saying that it's blue to the map. Um, so here we'll, we'll run it and it will see that the boundary is, is blue. Um, so the, the, I guess, kind of going back to the, the task of, at hand is to create this time series uh, GIF of the Landsat imagery that we've collected um, and processed. So um, to do that, we'll um, also want to add the date of the image onto the, essentially superimpose the date the text uh, of the date onto the image itself um, in in our each snapshot uh, through time in the video. So to do that, we're going to bring in this package um, and call it text. This just allows us to um, add text annotations to our images. Um, we're going to create a variable called RGB viz param, which essentially is the the visualization parameters that will apply to each image in our Landsat image collection. Um, and then um, define some arguments for the video itself. Um, so our region is going to be the buffered bounds that we created earlier. We're going to tell it to have three frames per second and a scale of uh, 10. Um, and then we also have a variable for annotations, which is just indicating where the text that we have for the dates um, is going to go on on each image. Um, and then lastly, we have this function called add text, which is actually going to take the date um, for each image. Um, so we can get that using the system time start, um, cast that to an earth engine date, and then an earth engine string. Um, so this system time start is um, not in the format that makes sense to us. So we're going to change the format to be in year, month, date. Um, so it's a little bit easier to understand what, what the actual date is. Um, and this is um, really essentially where we're bringing it all together here, where we have our, for each image in our image collection, we're going to clip it to our buffered bounds visualize it with the parameters that we specified above here. So it's going to be a true color image 
we're going to be showing red, green, blue with these various maximum and opacity um, settings. And then we're going to add the date um, as our uh, the date for that image onto the image um, through this annotated text.annotate image section. Um, and return annotated, which is the image with the date superimposed on top of it. So this function, add text, um, we're going to take and then map um, through each image in our image collection, um, being the Landsat image collection that we processed above. Um, so that will then give us uh, this image collection that has the date superimposed on top of it. Um, and with that, um, we can then create our video. So Earth Engine has this function called get video thumb URL, um, where we can take our um, image collection that has the time, this timestamp um, added as an annotation, apply this um, function, get video thumb URL, and then bring in the video args that we specified above. So telling it we want to create a video at our buffer bounds, give me three frames per second. Um, and then print that, um, which will show up then in our console. So if we hit run for this, so we see that the map switched to satellite. We have our just feature collection added to the map, but to see our outline, the uh, Pajarina refugee settlement boundary that was painted onto the image and added. Um, and then over here in the console, this link um, that if we open up, will then take us over to a new tab and the GIF of our Landsat uh, time series will show up with the dates on it. So here, I know this is going by really fast, but um, at the beginning of the time series, we saw that in 2015, there wasn't a, set, a settlement really identifiable. But then in 2016, it showed up. So let's let it loop through here again. And we can track that quick. So we were in 2015, no settlement, green, grass, 2016 hits. And then all of a sudden, we see the settlement established really quickly. So really, in a matter of a couple of Landsat scenes, we go from having no refugee settlement to having a street network, buildings, cleared land, um, you know, areas that are being exposed or cleared for agriculture. Um, and yeah, this, this rapid establishment that happens. Um, so even with Landsat data, you know, a 30, a 30 meter um, satellite image, we can see that this, this rapid establishment happens um, really quickly. And um, we can't, you know, get at these day-to-day -day changes because Landsat is only available, um, you know, just we're using Landsat 8 in this case, so 16-day revisit periods for, for Landsat 8, but um, we can, you know, visually, qualitatively interpret that the settlement is established quite fast. So this is a kind of a really, inter like, easy way to kind of get to know a, a study site um, by creating these these GIFs and time series uh, through time. And next, I'm um, kind of going up the, the chain of complexity and what we can do with time series is actually looking at a image by image um, approach to understanding changes through time. So there's a term called time series disturbance detection, which is essentially in, in remote sensing where you can look for disturbances in your full time series of satellite imagery. Um, and so we can use time series disturbance detection to document these different land cover changes 
um, within and around refugee settlements. So not only can we look at urbanization or you know the settlement being established itself, but look at changes in um, vegetation, bare ground, forest, um, you know any other kind of land cover that we're interested in to understand how is that pixel changing through time? Is it undergoing some sort of disturbance um, or change? And what does that mean for kind of the overall assessment of, of land cover at that area? So um, a land cover change or a disturbance um, can, can take on three different possible trajectories. There's a disturbance in a state change, which is shown here on the bottom left. So going from vegetation to urbanization, in this case, we have a drop in NDVI when we have a building being built in what was a grassland. So this is kind of a what we were just looking at with the before and after. So um, vegetation to urbanization is our state change. We can have also a disturbance that is a condition change. So if we're looking at um, grassland, for example, we could have a really bright green patch of grass um, that over time, whether due to drought or some sort of seasonal shift or um, application of some sort of, I don't know, um, <laughs> pesticide or something can undergo some sort of change in the condition of that land cover. So a grassland could go from being really bright green to less green. So this a little bit more gradual change um, would be a conditional change. Um, or we could have something that's a trajectory that is a disturbance. So some sort of, in this case, drop in recovery that's followed by, um, sorry, a drop in NDVI that's followed by recovery. So this is a little bit more complicated where we have, you know, being one at one point of, uh, in time having a certain NDVI value, having it drop, and then having it return to its near original uh, value. So these are just three different types of disturbances that, that can be tracked um, and studied uh, using this disturbance detection approach. Um, and so there's a variety of different disturbance detection algorithms available. Um, we're going to be using uh, one called breaks for additive seasonal and trend otherwise called bfast um which allows us to account for both long-term trends so um in the case of this conditional change something like browning due to a protracted drought um would be our long-term trend as well as seasonal trends so we know that we have you know shifts in um you know we go through dry seasons, rainy seasons, multiple, you know, different kind of changes throughout the year that may happen. So what BFAST um, is really kind of well equipped to do is handle both of these types of long-term and seasonal trends um, and kind of set that aside when we're trying to understand or identify disturbances. So um, on an image by image basis, um, we can essentially identify these more nuanced disturbances that we may not, um, that we would not have been able to capture with other disturbance detection algorithms, um, which may see some sort of long-term trend as a disturbance, or may see some sort of seasonal trend as a disturbance. But BFAST um, takes those um, different long-term and short-term trends into account um, to help us identify more kind of like acute changes in our in our time series um, at every given pixel. So a little bit more kind of nuts and bolts of, of BFAST. Um, the inputs are an image time series, so you can use Landsat imagery, Sentinel-2, MODIS, um, whatever um, image, you know, archive you want to use. And then the other input is defined parameters, which we'll get to in the next slide, but essentially different knobs that you as the user can define and, and change um, to test out how BFAST is doing at identifying disturbances in your time series. Um, and what BFAST provides as the output is a pixel level 
state of disturbance, um, which is called the breakpoint timing. Um, so this is when in the time series that, you, that BFAS identifies some sort of pixel level um, disturbance. Um, and the second output is a magnitude of change. So if you're using um, a time series with NDVI, you could use whatever really variable you're interested in, NDVI, um, just a green band, sphere, um, but whatever your variable of interest is that you're using um, in your time series, it will give you the magnitude of change, which is essentially the difference or the medial residual between the expected and observed values um, during this, what is called the monitoring period. So this graphic, I think, helps maybe illustrate what BFAST is doing a little bit. Um, so with our time series, um, which is here, these gray dots. So we have here 2010 through 2015. We have some sort of spectrometric. Let's just say this is NDVI that we're looking at through time. So our gray dots are fluctuating through the year as we have a rainy and dry season. Um, and then we're getting up into mid-2012 and we see this drop in the gray dots through time. So we know that, you know, there's something happening. But let's use BFAST to help us model that disturbance. So what we do is we create a, uh, define a historical period and a monitoring period. So a historical period is the time period that we're telling BFAST to learn this time series. And by learning the time series, it will create both these harmonic and linear components. Um, so we're essentially starting in 2012 and working backwards. BFAST will be looking backwards in time to create this modeled fit, which is this blue line, which takes into account both the linear trend. So there is somewhat of an increase in NDVI over time. Um, which is fine, that, that's okay, BFAS will be able to account for that, um, as well as the harmonic trend. So we have these little like dips here at the top of the curve, um, as well as the giant or the, the main uh, switches here between the peaks and the troughs of this curve, are, which are our dry and wet seasons. So BFAS creates this model fit, and then we'll extend that model fit into the monitoring period. So it will um, continue that from 2012 onwards, and then BFAS will then um, look at the differences between the model fit, so the blue, the solid blue line, and the time series itself, and create these model residuals, which is the gray dotted line. So this is the difference between the expected, which is the blue line, our model BFAS fit, and what is observed, which is our image time series over time. And we have these, these differences, which then, um, based off of the input parameters, depending on how big these differences are, um, BFAS will essentially then flag, OK, when we have a really big difference consistently for a given amount of time, that's a disturbance. And so we see here. Um, you know, just looking at the gray dots, they're coming along, fluctuating through through time every year, and then there's a drop. And then BFAST um, will identify what is called the breakpoint, which is that date of disturbance, um, and then calculate for at that given date what is the magnitude of change on the difference between the expected and the observed. So that difference, let's say, you know, going from this value down to this value then is our, our expected change um, or the, the actual observed change in the, the variable of interest. So um, yeah, this, this schematic is, is really illustrative of kind of what we'll be, what we'll be showing here in the next uh, kind of little task. Um, so I mentioned that there's different parameters that the user can define. Um, when setting up their BFAST model. Um, so this kind of gets back to something that Jamie mentioned earlier, which is really knowing the landscape um, that you're working in, or at least seasonally what's going on um, throughout the year. So 
um, we can essentially tell it be fast how many if we want to have linear trends so do we want to account for these long-term seasonal greenings or brownings or any kind of long-term trends over time um, tell it what uh, if we want to include a harmonic so in this case yes we want to include um, you know this um, ordered model so we have um, both our dry and wet seasons that we're going to account for and then we have various parameters um, that essentially allow BFAS to identify what it means to be a disturbance so there's this value called H um, order which is the the how many harmonics will actually include in the model fit um, history, which is essentially how BFAS will understand um, what a stable history period is when it's creating the model fit, um, and the um, the dates of interest for the historical period and the monitoring period. So um, these, you know, really are just kind of different knobs to play with when defining the BFAS model, and and do have quite a bit of bearing on the actual outputs. Um, but really depend on uh, case by case, you know, what the value should be. Um, and, um, you know, also just like as a, you know, kind of experimenting with the, the different parameters to, to see what the outputs are and how they align with your expectations. <laughs> um, so this is um, what Pajarina looks like for uh, using, or what BFAS looks like at Pajarina using um, Sentinel-2 in this case. Um, we see here for um, the settlement area, um, this is looking at NDVI through time, these fluctuations happening, um, and then our, our black dots drop off in 2016. So for this red dot area here, we see here in June 2016, vegetation in by September of 2016, definitely built up urbanization happening. So of course we have this drop off in NDVI and BFAS will then allow us to see when that time period is that it detects a disturbance. In this case, it detected this for October, which is a little bit later than we see here, but um, nevertheless, a disturbance happening. Um, and then the magnitude of change, so about a, 0.25 decrease in NDVI from before and after. And then for this area here where we have a non-settlement um, point, so a place that just main, you know, remains um, vegetated, we just have our time series and there's no disturbance detected. So in that case, you know, we can also use BFAS for understanding where there's stability essentially over time in our land cover, or uh, at least the NDVI. Um, time series. So um, BFAST, there is code that, that does exist um, for using BFAST in the code editor, but we are going to use an app um, called BFAST Monitor, Google Earth Engine app, um, to essentially apply BFAST um, at Pajarina. Um, just for some context, Pajarina, or sorry, BFAST was uh, originally written in R and has since been adapted to Earth Engine. So um, if you really kind of want to like get into the weeds and use BFAST, I would actually recommend um, checking out BFAST Monitor um, as it exists in R, but knowing that you can use it also in Earth Engine um, if, if you want to. So with the app, um, you know, it's really quite simple and kind of like what we're going to be doing in terms of using BFAST, but um, I just had this already loaded here because it does take a couple of minutes to, um, once you kind of hit update um, for it to run, but um, walking through the different parameters that we can set here. So we have a start of history, which I've defined for 2012, end of history, the end of 2015. So we have this um, four year time period for our history. For the monitoring, we're going to start January 1st, 2016, and have it go through the end of 2018. These are just the default uh, additional parameters. So we have H, period, alpha, magnitude, and harmonics. 
I did change the harmonics to be two, so we have this um, order of two harmonic that the model is being fit to. And then once you define these, hit update both maps, and then this will update. So you can kind of see Pajarina um, underneath here. Um, but um, yeah, so on the left hand, it will show the time of change. So 2016 through 2019, as set here from our state of monitoring 2016 through end of 2018. The color being really like this kind of white or lighter blue being closer to 2016 and then darker being later on. So this is when BFAST dist detects a disturbance. Um, and then the magnitude of change, which is our, our change from the expected um, based on the modeled fit from the historical period to the observed. So bright colors mean some sort of large magnitude of change. And then on the right here, we can click on different areas to see um, on a pixel by pixel instance when the break point or the, they're calling it here, break time was the magnitude of change, um, the longitude and latitude of the point that you clicked, as well as the plotted time series. Um, so this is really um, you know, helpful for kind of illustrating the time series um, you know, on an image by image basis. Um, so the other kind of caveat here of using the BFAST monitor Earth Engine app is that this is just set up to show um, normalized difference moisture index. And so far we've been looking at normalized difference vegetation index. Um, so just know that that's kind of the variable of interest that's being shown here, but um, you know, the different variables depending on, on the disturbance that you're trying to detect um, that you could use. So um, yeah, if we're, just going back to the map here, um, if we're looking at the time of change, um, we see here that it actually is doing really well in picking up like what we know to be the built up area and uh, defining uh, that time of change that's detected for all those pixels as, you know, in the 2016 range. So um, even using an index like normalized difference moisture index, we can we can see this um establishment of the settlement built up area itself um and then if we switch over to the magnitude of change um again you know seeing a pretty good distinction between the built up area having pretty significant changes in the magnitude of change compared to the expected um with the outline shown in in bright and then if i just click uh somewhere on the map uh this will update here on the right hand council so while the charts are loading so i clicked somewhere around here about um and we see yeah that the breakpoint is middle you know about a 2016 so right on track with when we know the settlement was established in june of 2016 and that we have a breakpoint magnitude for that pixel that i clicked on about a decrease in 0.38 in our ndmi um and then the chart that gets printed out below is our historical time series so you know as to be expected we have these shifts seasonally, year to year that are happening. Um, so this is the blue dots, the NDMI, the actual pixel values, and then the fitted model that we created. So we can see that even with, you know, these parameters that are set over here, we have a pretty good model fit for the time series, and then our monitoring period. So again, that model fit gets projected into the future during the monitoring period. And then the actual and DMI values from 2016 through 2018. And we do see this drop off happening in middle of 2016. Um, and that's, it's not shown here, but you know, that's when we have 
this essentially this um, these breakpoints, um, the break times being being identified um, that are displayed here. So that 2016 middle 2016 date here is then visualized here, and that difference between the expected and observed is then visualized here in the bright values. So um, yeah, this is uh, you know kind of a really useful you know way to get started with using VFast and interacting with it and kind of experimenting with the different parameters just said and historical and uh, the monitoring periods. Um, and it's yeah, a bit of a foray into these kind of denser time series disturbance detection algorithms. Um, that really gets allows you to see on an image by image basis what's happening at a pixel level, um, and that then allows you to um, make some inferences then about the the types of changes that you're seeing. So um, yeah, so um, shifting back here to some. Uh, findings that we've had uh, with BFAST at Pajarina as well, um, looking at NDVI in this case, um, we can see that there's definitely different types of changes in the magnitude in NDVI that we can map onto different types of line cover conversions. So, um, you know, even with using BFAST outputs, we can see that there's like elements of the street network that come through. So, like these darker grid-like patterns have these really, um, you know, more significant decreases in NDVI. And then also places that have, you know, pretty dense built up areas like the reception center. So this is like the large kind of office area that um, people, when they arrive at Pajarina are processed um, into the settlement, um, the market center, um, a clearing for child-friendly spaces, another market center, a refugee response office. So these little clusters of dark, um, the purple indicating um, big decreases in NDVI. Um, we can then begin to connect these different changes in NDVI with actual landscape features, which is super cool. Um, and similarly, we can do the same with thinking about things like conversions from natural vegetation to, to agriculture. So um, this kind of approach for tracking um, disturbances kind of then is this jumping off point for understanding these different types of land cover conversions. Um, and if we look at the dates of disturbance that we see, we can also kind of begin to paint out this step-by-step -step narrative or account of um, when the settlement's being established and when it's expanding um, and can kind of then build up these um, larger kind of inferences about rates of change over time. Um, so we see that um, with the breakpoint date from BFAST showing um, that the majority of the settlements being established in mid to late 2016. Um, so in this image here is showing the is colored by the month um, of disturbance detected in 2016. So lots of greens, yellows, you know, showing the mid to late 2016. And then for 2017, the disturbances that are detected are at the beginning of the year. And this is in the spaces that um, we qualitatively interpreted to be more the agricultural areas where there's conversions happening um, where our, you know, larger agricultural plots are being established, um, which also aligns with you know, when kind of the, the sowing season starts in, in that part of Uganda. So um, these you know, kind of quantitative assessments of pixel level changes and dates of changes um, maps onto our expectations of when we should see landscape, landscape changes um, over time. Um, and we can also, like thinking about in the, the total area that is disturbed, compare that to the, the total settlement boundary itself. Um, and one of our 
another interesting finding from, from looking at this is that the total disturbed area actually mapped on pretty well to the, the total settlement boundary itself, um, which helps us verify that we're detecting changes that, <laughs> that did occur within the boundary, um, which is cool. So um, this is just another kind of figure showing you know, the amount of area that's disturbed every month and then um, annotating that amount of area disturbed with the, the actual changes that we see. So um, again, you know, kind of back in mid-2016, the settlement is officially opened. People start to um, arrive. Um, there's roads and structures that begin to appear in August. And then we have this kind of rapid period of disturbance um, where the settlement grows up until the end of 2016. And then we have this drop off in total area disturbed. Um, but the area that is disturbed then, as you remember, is kind of on the edges of where the actual built up area is, which is where the agriculture um, is established and um, those plots of areas uh, begin to become converted. So um, yeah, this is just kind of another way to, to illustrate one of the outputs from, from BFAS. Um, and yeah, as we see here, the, the timing of the, the actual disturbance, the magnitude and spatial extent of the changes um, map onto our expectations of when refugee populations arrive, um, which is really useful because the publicly available data, at least on, on UNHCR population estimates, isn't always available on a you know 16 day revisit period it may only be available at the month or quarterly or yearly um if you can track down that data and so you know having this kind of alternative way to understand um changes in a landscape and in this case we we're really interested in looking at the growth of the settlement itself is kind of a proxy for understanding populations um, arriving, um, you know, or potentially land being abandoned and populations leaving. So this is another way to kind of get at that, um, get at monitoring population changes over time. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, again, like the, the, this is, not just an issue in Uganda, this is an issue at other refugee settlements as well, the, the lack of population data that may be available. And so um, this approach of using time series detection can be really flexible um, in different places, um, which uh, satellite data is a really useful data source for understanding um, some of these settlement level population dynamics that we may not otherwise have been able to understand just looking at uh, UNHCR provided um, reports or um, data or different types of uh, information. So now we're going to shift into the last part of the training, which is looking at and comparing different population data sets. Um, I'm just going to point uh, you all towards this interesting tool called PopCode Viewer, which allows you to actually look at different population data sets for the same location. Um, so you can look at um, these are not the only ones that they have available on there, but in this case, we can look at global human settlement population, global population for the world, world pop, land scan. Um, and this kind of, you know, just this screenshot itself shows the really the pretty stark differences that do exist between uh, these different products at the same location. Um, so this is just really our first lesson in. Uh, seeing how different population data sets estimate um, population for the exact same location. So for uh, our case study, we're going to be comparing three uh, commonly used uh, satellite-derived population data sets um, that disaggregate population at the pixel level. So as Jamin mentioned earlier, these are satellite-informed, so each of these three uh, data sets are taking satellite data kind of at the as one of their inputs to create these population estimates. So we'll be looking at GHSL, um, which uses Landsat imagery, is available at 250 meters, 
um, is available for these different time periods. It's hosted as an Earth Engine asset, um, which we'll be using. We'll also be looking at the high resolution settlement layer. Um, also uses Landsat is available at a higher spatial resolution of 30 meters. So uh, the native resolution of Landsat, um, but it's just a single timestamp with imagery sourced from sometime in the period of 2011 to 2015, depending on the location. This is also shared as a um, public Earth Engine asset. And then uh, lastly, we'll be looking at the World Pop Constraint data product, um, which has a bunch of different geospatial uh, covariates, as well as building footprints that come from satellite data. Um, and this is available at, the, at 100 meters um, and is available annually. Um, I, I will say it's available annually. Um, and but we'll be using the 2020 version, and this is also shared as a Earth Engine public asset. Um, and much of these are, you know, they kind of have these different approaches of how each of these data sets are created. But um, you know, they're taking a number of different inputs, including satellite imagery, to 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 estimate population. Oftentimes, they're using what's called a dissymmetric approach, which essentially allocates known population totals from the census data two areas that it models to be areas where people are living. So that could be informed usually from satellite imagery where there's built up areas or some sort of structure. Um, these data products will take that, that population total from census and allocate population totals to those built up areas um, that it's modeled. So they um, operate very differently, but you know, side by side in terms of the, the basic methodology there, um, using this asymmetric approach kind of across the board. Okay, so lastly, we're gonna look here at comparing the estimates of population counts from those three satellite drive population products um, and compare them with what UNHCR says the population is. So I clicked on the code link and this is popping up. So, uh, this all looks familiar to you all. We're again bringing in Pajarina. Um, and then also having, um, we're going to bring in the full, uh, all the refugee settlement boundaries in Uganda as well. So we're going to do kind of a cross settlement um, comparison. Um, and then here's where we bring in our population data sets. So we have the GHSL POP, um, which is available here through this image collection. Uh, we're gonna filter it to the most recent one being the 2015 one and uh, select the population count, rename it as population. Um, we're gonna then bring in HRSL pop, um, which is this data set hosted here as this asset, um, rename it B1 to population. And then lastly, bring in the world pop, um, which again is hosted on Earth Engine filter it to just the Uganda data and select the population data. Or sorry, this is uh, the band called population. Um, so first we're gonna do some, just visualize it on um, the three different data sets. So we're gonna take each one and uh, for each uh, pixel, we're gonna have this visualization from zero to 50 um, with this palette, which I'll show here. Um, so, Click run, check it out. So, actually, let's turn these off again. So, um, right now we're just looking at the JHSL pop. I'll zoom out here so you have a little bit more context. So, we do have some variability happening. Um, the blue, based off of our visualization parameters, is low population. This bright kind of neon green is higher population. So what we see here, though, at Padrina is that GHSL is not uh, estimating any population totals, or at least it's not allocating any population to the pixels that fall within uh, where Padrina is at. So GHSL is, you know, not doing well here at estimating population, which we know there to be about 36,000 South Sudanese refugees. Residing at. So, not great. 
Um, if we look at HRSL pop, um, here, you know, it does have, um, it's allocating some population to the side, or at least, a, you know, this kind of village to the west of Pajarina, but not estimating, you know, there's like one pixel up here, one on the side here that it's allocating some to, but again, it's not estimating any population totals within, within uh, Pajarina itself. And then lastly, if we take a look at World Pop, we see a pretty different story. We have uh, actually a lot of population being estimated within the boundary itself. So um, this is, um, you know, the where it's estimating population to is conforming pretty well to where we see the built-up area that we learned about in the previous task. So, you know, just qualitatively looking at the the visual visualizing the population data, data sets, we see that uh, World Pop's doing pretty good off the bat. Um, next in the script, we're going to print uh, just the, the scale of which, which we already know, but just to confirm, GHSL is at 2050, HRSL is at about 30, World Pop's says 92 here, um, just based off the projection, but nominally about 100 globally for, for where it's available. And then Next, we're going to just summarize for each settlement boundary uh, the total estimated population with our, our three population data sets. So to do that, we're going to use uh, this reduced region function, as well as one of the map functions that we, we used previously um, before. So we're going to take our settlement boundaries, and for each feature in our settlement boundaries feature collection, map over it. And we're going to, in this case for GHSL pop, um, select it, rename the band to GHSL, and then reduce over that feature, um, i.e. we're going to take the sum of the population totals at GHSL pop using the GHSL pop scale um, for that feature's geometry. And um, this is just a max pixel to essentially allow us to reduce that, that total within the feature. So um, this is going to allow us to get, for each settlement boundary, the total populated or a total estimated population. And we're going to apply that same kind of setup for HRSL as well as for World Pop. And then um, uh, so that those totals get added on as properties into the settlement boundaries feature collection. And then within that, so we have the unit GR population and then each of the three estimated population totals from the three data sets. We're going to calculate the difference between the unit GR pop. So that's the official population estimate and then the estimated population estimates um, from these three and create three additional properties called GHSL diff, HRSL diff, and world pop diff. Um, and then with that data, um, we're gonna essentially chart the differences between the unit GR pop and uh, the three different population estimates for both um, settlements that have less than and greater than 25,000 people. Um, so to do that, we're going to filter first out um, the less than or greater than for 25,000 for the unit GR pop, and then create lists for the values for GHSL, HRSL, and world pop, um, essentially um, taking all the, the population estimates for GHSL, HRSL, and world pop using this aggregate array function and putting it into a list. Um, and then do the same um, uh, for the world pop. This is just setting up here for our less than 25,000. Um, so we have these various lists that we're gonna actually use to chart um, in this ui.chart array values. So we have our y values, which is our, um, our three different lists of DHSL, HSL, and world pop, as well as our x values of the unit GR pop. And then we're gonna chart them and do that same setup for the, the populations that are greater than 25,000. Um, also put them into a chart. 
print those two charts, which we'll see over here on the side. Um, so this is showing on the x-axis the unit GR population, and then on the y-axis the estimated population for the greater and less than. Um, and we see here that really, like we have really low estimates for the estimated um, kind of across the board, and it gets a little bit better for the greater than 20, or sorry, for the less than 25,000, but um, yeah, overall we're seeing pretty severe underestimations of population happening. Um, and then lastly, we can just look at some of the stats for these differences in values. So if we print out um, stats using this aggregate stats function, um, we can see, for example, for the GHSL differences, the max difference is about 23 mean, so this is the average difference between the GHSL and the unit GEOPOP is negative 30,000 about, which is pretty significant. Um, you know, on average, we're seeing an underestimation of 30,000 people across all the settlements. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty significant. Um, and we can look at, you know, across for each of them, again, for HRSL, the mean is about 30,000 underestimate, uh, 22,000 underestimate for world pop. So even though world pop was doing well when we looked at this qualitatively, um, we're still seeing on average, it's underestimating about 23,000 people across our, our unit jar, refugee settlements in Uganda. So um, yeah, this really kind of illustrates the, you know, both, through qualitative looking at, at, the, at the data sets as well as printing out these charts and stats, how much each of these population data sets are underestimating total population. So here, just showing again what we were just looking at. Um, and so really why is this the case um, that the population data sets are um, underestimating? Well, because they're being, uh, they're taking these national level census data, which off the bat already don't include refugee populations. So, you know, really kind of the input data that's going into these population satellite informed population data sets is already kind of excluding these uh, refugee populations. And that is trickling down then into what, how much total populations are being estimated at the settlements themselves. And we end up having these pretty grave underestimations of, of population uh, populations at refugee settlements. Um, and there are uh, consequences for this. Um, you know, we have these uh, cascading data impacts that happen in terms of estimating population, whether that's, you know, these population data sets are used for a bunch of different applications, whether that's identifying where a clinic needs to be set up or you know, schools or distributing, you know, different resources, um, sending out early warning systems, you know, there's kind of a bunch of different instances where population data sets are used to make decisions about how, um, you know, to provide services or assist people um, if, you know, there's some sort of disaster or event that happens. And so um, the fact that these these population data sets aren't accounting for um, these populations even further marginalizes and um, you know leaves people kind of in the dark in terms of um, potential services or resources that they may otherwise have been able to access if if these uh, populations were properly represented in the data sets themselves. Wanted to leave everyone with uh, some really great. Um, peer-reviewed literature that's kind of di diving into these data sets. Um, so, you know, we shared some of our, our work from the BFAS stuff, but um, there's stuff looking at population um, in more depth and, and land cover change, as well as looking at SDG changes and monitoring SDGs. Um, yeah, so all of these link to, to those papers. Um, and that's it. We are now at the question phase. So please enter in uh, your questions in the Q&A box and um, happy to answer them as they come in or answer any questions that come up. So.
Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so there's a lot to digest there. If you have any uh, follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, Hannah or me or both of us. Um, as a reminder, this uh, presentation, as well as the recording, uh, we have the permalink there at the bottom of the page. And uh, that's it for this training. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, please join Hannah and me at the next part, part three of the training, detecting agricultural and vegetation changes in and surrounding refugee settlements. Thanks, everyone. Great, and thank you to everybody that have been submitting questions over the past hour uh, and 45 minutes. We really appreciate them. They're really great questions. We hope that you'll continue to submit if you have any. So jumping right in, uh, question number one, does the refugee settlement analysis include those refugees displaced due to climate change or disasters? And feel free to unmute yourself if you want to answer, either Hannah or Jamin. Yeah, I can jump in with this. Um, this is a really great question that gets um, asked a lot. Um, and there is some kind of complexity to it, given that there are certain legal standards and kind of these different designations that accompany what it means to be a refugee. So uh, refugees, yeah, as we have written here, are technically only populations displaced by violence or a threat of persecution. So there's a, not really narrow, but there, there's a, UNHCR has their own kind of designation and that is deemed from the UN about what it means to be a refugee and what protections are offered to refugees. Um, and climate refugees are not under that, don't fall under that designation. So um, they're, yeah, technically a different population of concern as the UN refers to them. Um, and so, yeah, this training where really it just pertains to to those that are under the protection of the UNHCR or, or do have that formal refugee status. Um, so those who have been affected by violence against civilians or armed conflict or any kind of um, persecution. Um, and yeah, this this link here um, from UNHCR about what is a refugee kind of out, uh, outlines all of those different designations and, and provides a, the definition for it. Um, there are um, also people who are displaced um, but aren't crossing uh, an international border, so remain within their home country. Um, and those uh, populations are referred to as internally displaced persons or IDPs. And there are IDPs that uh, are displaced due to conflict and or climate or disaster related events. Um, and so those populations are, are very different from what it is to be a refugee, but um, also, you know, face similar challenges um, in terms of being displaced. Um, and there is a, a group called the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center that does monitor those populations and provides data information on, on the type of displacement and um, different locations that IDPs are at. So if you're interested in, in looking at IDPs, um, you can check out their, their website that we have listed here as well. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, Anna. Uh, question number two, is this data, satellite remote sensing data for monitoring humanitarian conditions available for the public? I may have missed you saying this. What is the resolution of this data and its temporal resolution too? I can jump in with this one as well. Um, yeah, so all the data that we're using in this training um, both in the previous training and the future trainings is, is publicly available. Um, and most of it's coming either from NASA, whether it's uh, Landsat 8 or MODIS imagery, or from the European Space Agency, uh, ESO, for that we're using both Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1. And all of that, all of those imagery uh, data sets are, are publicly available. Um, and yeah, the spatial, and temporal and spectral resolution really depends on the data set um, that you're using. So for this training number two, we 
are exclusively using Landsat 8, um, which is a 30 meter optical um, imagery data set um, and is nominally available about every 16 days. Although if you're using different Landsat um, imagery from different Landsat sensors like Landsat 5 and 7, that uh, frequency or cadence of imagery availability goes down to about eight days. Um, and yeah, the, the data catalog link for Landsat 8 um, that we're using in this training um, can be accessed through that link there. Great, thanks, Hannah. Uh, question number three, is the calculus about NDVI disturbance, uh, reference on page 37, made for all pixels in the image's area of interest or a sample or a mean value? Uh, this is Jamin. Can you hear me okay? I can try this one. We sure can, Jamin. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the, this is a, a good question. So um, BFAST and most other time series disturbance techniques work at the pixel level. So we have, as we show, um, a series of uh, different maps that give us results of timing of the disturbance as well as the magnitude of disturbance. And there's several other metrics, in fact, um, at the pixel level. So um, we don't tend to, uh, we, we do this in particular because we do this kind of analysis because we want information at the pixel level. Um, so we, it's helpful to take a sample of uh, perhaps the average magnitude of disturbance across an image um, and certainly characterizing the conditions across the image before running BFAST so we understand what kind of condition is there in terms of NDVI. But when we actually get the results, that's at the pixel level. Um, we can aggregate it any way we like after that, though, of course. All right, thanks, Jamin. Uh, question four, what happens if the environment in which we calculate the NDVI is more like a desert? Does it affect the quality of the results? I can start on this one, too. Um, yeah, this is a more difficult scenario. It definitely would affect the quality of the results. The whole premise here is that we see a stark contrast in vegetation, or rather in condition and spectral value before the settlement is established or expanded and during or after that's concluded. So really what we're looking at is the conversion from vegetation to non-vegetation. In our case study, that's, that's the scenario. And across most refugee case, uh, different study areas, that would be a similar sort of setting. Refugee settlements um, across Sub-Saharan Africa uh, tend to be established in um, rather somewhat vegetated. We're not talking about clearing a forest to make a new settlement, but there's usually a background kind of vegetation. There are cases, um, of course, where we have much more uh, arid or sparse or barren uh, landscapes, and we have a, a famous well-known camp called Zatari in Jordan, which is a Syrian refugee camp, which uh, is basically non-vegetated before uh, this, this, the refugee camp is established. So this does come up. It's a good question. Um, it's a similar kind of challenge to detecting refugee settlement um, or IDP, internally displaced person encampments at the edge of an existing city, right? So it's, that's sort of a similar situation where we're looking at a different kind of urbanization at the edge of an already urbanized area. Um, so NDVI is not going to work in this in this case. Um, if we don't have a strong vegetation signal prior to the establishment, um, we're not going to be able to detect, um, you know, meaningfully a large drop in vegetation signal with the establishment or the subsequent expansion. So um, in that case, I would turn to other kinds of uh, of metrics, um, those that would be better at discriminating. Um, bare areas or from built up areas. Um, and so we, in our written answer here, we provide a couple of these examples. The normalized difference built up index um, would be one. Um, the normalized burn ratio may be helpful if there's some kind of um, clearing that took place specifically like to, to raise whatever sparse vegetation there was prior to the establishment, um, which is common in some areas. Um, that could be helpful as well. Um, and then there's a really new index that's been produced called the Artificial Surface Index, which is designed 
to it, it, it has um, better sensitivity to discriminating artificial built up surfaces from bare lands. Um, and so that could also be could be brought in in this uh, sort of scenario. But that, that's a, a good question. That's a challenging context. Thanks, Jamin. Uh, question five, has there been any application of BFAST on other types of Earth observing system data, for example, uh, SAR data? Um, yes, there have been several studies. It's usually done a little bit differently where we have uh, SAR is often brought in as a complement to optical data or it's brought in as or in a sort of fusion scenario where we do a kind of disturbance detection with optical and then a kind of disturbance detection with active SAR data and then we we merge the two together to see um, to basically uh, use all detected disturbances from both approaches. Um, BFAST is is also as, as mentioned just one of these kinds of uh, time series disturbance techniques. There's another commonly used approach called CCDC which is a more recent uh, algorithm that's been developed and has a lot of sort of uh, shared sort of um, much in the same uh, logic around developing a curve to fit the time series and then detecting deviations from that. It's a little more, um, there's a little more um, sensitivity to potential differences within the time series itself uh, rather than just fitting a single curve. At a given pixel like BFAST does, CCDC um, can, is more sensitive to variations over time at the pixel level as well. Um, but with both of these approaches, there have been different examples. Usually this has um, been done in a case uh, in the context of detecting forest cover changes. And we have a couple of examples here in the written answer. Um, and uh, there are also some examples of using nighttime lights data for um, working with BFAST uh, or CCDC, and we, we link to those. So really any kind of scenario where you have time series data that um, are expected to have, or it's the strength of BFAST or CCDC would be looking at time series data where you have some kind of, of natural um, uh, oscillation, some kind of seasonality to the signal. And that's there in uh, SAR data, of course, that's there in optical data, that's there in nighttime lights as well, because nighttime lights um, emissions, electricity emissions vary depending on the day and, and depending on the month. So. Um, any scenario where we have those data uh, that we uh, want to detect the kind of deviations, key dates of change in the trend prior to that date, um, we should be able to do uh, ha make some progress in that direction using BFAST or CCDC. So it's certainly not just limited to optical data. It's a good question. Wonderful. And question six, uh, is there any available BFAST script in Google Earth Engine? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I would say yes, in a very, um, a lot of the code is kind of like under development and I'm not sure if it's actively being maintained or developed. Um, I'm going to post in the chat um, a paper kind of supporting or introducing the BFAST monitor app that was, that we showed in the training, um, as well as the GitHub to the site showing the code for that. Um, yeah, so I think if, if you want to use the code that, that does exist, um, there's a bit of um, kind of like finagling of the code underneath the, the functions that are available to use um, whatever metric you want or any kind of image input. So there's that caveat to it. Um, but yes, there is some available BFAST script in Earth Engine that I will try to post here in the chat. Great, thanks, Anna. Uh, and question number seven, is it possible to use BFAST for time series analysis of forest change, degradation, uh, disaster impact assessment, tree phenology, mapping, urban growth, mapping, et cetera? Um, yeah, um, it's certainly possible. I would say the forest change and degradation is, is probably the most common application period of BFAST or time series disturbance detection analysis. Um, disaster impact assessment, um, and uh, I've seen m less of that, nothing really comes to mind in there. I think the, the, um, the 
a person asking the question may be thinking of something like a landslide or a flood. Um, that could that could happen. I think that would prob probably be a little bit more um, commonly done with a before after scenario because that disaster or natural hazard um, often we know about the timing of it. And so one thing that one reason we use BFAST is that we don't know the timing um, and it happens in a spatially diffuse way. And so it's just more difficult to detect. But uh, a localized landslide, for example, or a localized flood, um, we tend to have a little bit more information. Not to say we have the full picture, but there might be more commonly used ways to detect that. Um, and there I'm thinking mainly of like a before-after uh, bitemporal change analysis. Um, tree phenology mapping, that's a good question. I, uh, I don't know. I haven't come across any examples. I haven't sought that out. Um, either uh, there may be something out there I could see um, using similar techniques, but again, the, the phonology suggests that, sorry, um, if we're interested in phonology, then we're interested in tracking, really identifying those seasonality trends that we see. Um, BFAST does that, but and then it also goes into this disturbance detection analysis. So there's probably better approaches um, to doing a, a tree phenology study if we're interested in looking at uh, changes in magnitude, uh, sorry, changes in condition via looking at the magnitude of NDVI at a given um, time in the year. Um, there, I'm thinking about uh, things like time series decomposition techniques, where you look at the seasonal harmonic and you're looking at the trend as well. Um, that's a kind of what has happening in the background to be fast anyways. Um, and so that's probably a little bit more effective um, for a, a, a proper phenological analysis. Urban growth mapping, yes, that's another that's a good example where where BFAST would be really helpful because that could be happening at different rates at different locations. We don't really we may not know exactly the location and the right and the exact time of year or or year period where that's happening. So, that's a scenario where looking at uh, a citywide, um, you know, the boundary or even the internal area of a city and tracking changes with BFAST would be a really good example. And um, certainly there are uh, lots of examples of urbanization um, using these kind of time series analysis techniques. Great. Thanks, Javen. Uh, question eight. While coding the image collection, Anna had filtered out cloud cover images, but we could still see them in the output GIF. Why is that? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so we're doing the filtering based on an image level property called cloud cover, which is a representation of the total percent of the image that is um, from like NASA's processing uh, deemed as cloud. And so we're filtering, I think, to less than or equal to 40% cloud cover. So there are still some images that have clouds in them. Um, and yeah, because we're we're filtering at the image level, um, you know, there there's parts of the image that still have clouds in them that just so happen to fall over Pajarina where we're looking at. Um, so we're because we're not looking at the full landsat image, we're just looking at the image that is clipped to Pajarina. That's why we still have clouds coming through um, and that are represented. You can see them in the GIF that we produce. Um, you could also this is a very like basic cloud um, processing approach to just filter at the image level. Um, but you could also use something like cloud masking where you, uh, on a pixel by pixel basis, mask out uh, pixels that are deemed to be cloudy, um, which would be a more kind of rigorous approach for dealing with clouds and filtering uh, those pixels out um, if you wanted to have more cloud-free imagery represented in the time series. So we don't show that here in the training, but um, that's possible to do. Yeah. Great, thanks, Hannah. Uh, question nine, what is the accuracy of global population data in urban areas? Which population data is more accurate? Uh, we touch on a couple of these leading products. If we're talking about the geospatial products, specifically remote sensing and forum products, um, WorldPOP and GHSL, as well as a product called LandScan, which we did not include, um, are uh, commonly used, and they would have nominal accuracies in the 90% usually, uh, 90 or above. 
especially in these large, dense urban areas. Um, that question of accuracy is um, difficult to answer because the there's no single de definitive global population data set out there. Um, this is something that I, I think was maybe surprising to Han and I when we started doing this research, but talking to people who are world experts in using remote sensing products to estimate local population or population density, um, they'll say, right, no one really knows what the actual population is. The, the validation data that we would use national censuses um, itself are, well, they're out of date, you know, inherently they're, they're a snapshot of population and things change in some cases very dramatically right after that those data are collected. Um, so we don't always have, uh, we don't have perfect um, estimations out there just as, a, as far as a baseline, as far as a validation data, data set to begin with. Um, but the, uh, the products that uh, we list here, WorldPop, GHS7, LandScan, tend to have um, pretty high accuracies. Um, I'm not actually sure, I think, the question which population data is more accurate. Um, I think that might vary sort of study to study and context to context. I don't know of, you know, globally, like the average accuracy, but um, that, that information is probably out there. Um, the real challenge of this, though, is um, is detecting, right, if we, if we already have population data from censuses reliable in large urban areas, um, our approach to trying to estimate that with remote sensing data derived information is still helpful, but we, we know the, uh, uh, you know, an approximation of it from census data, for example. The real challenge is going into rural areas. Um, it's going into newly established areas. It's going into parts of urban areas that are uh, informal, that are not part of the national census data collection effort or it's in areas where people are undocumented um, or where people are um, intimidated from registering in the census, which happens in lots of different contexts around the world. People don't want to be recorded, right? Um, this is where these, these products get really, um, it's incredibly uncertain how well they do in those scenarios. The whole premise of these products is we look at an indication of built upness um, and we get at that from a bunch of different uh, remote sensing products. And then we use that to build, uh, well, the, the people that make these products use a series of different modeling techniques to take those national level, or in some cases, local or regional level population, and then estimate through a series of different, say, regressions or deep learning techniques to estimate how that um, suggestion of population through remote sensing indication how well that aligns, they, they, they calibrate that with known uh, census data. Um, again, that starts breaking down in areas where we don't have those census data collected in the first place or places where we have new populations that have arrived since the census data were collected. Um, so the urban areas is probably a place where we're doing really, really well overall, you know, the 90, 90th percentile or higher. It's the rural areas, the informal areas, where we have much, much lower accuracy. And the paper that Hen and I put out on this um, discusses some of the challenges of looking at urbanization, uh, of detecting urbanization to begin with. If we can't detect uh, urban human settlement presence, then we're not going to do well at these global population data estimates either. Great, thanks so much, Shaman. And uh, last question, um, where do we have to input slash select the indices when calculating BFAST in Google Earth Engine? Yeah, so um, this Earth Engine uh, link here um, that's being showed is, is kind of the latest version of the beta code for the raw Earth Engine script um, that uses BFAST and so in there, there's a variable on, on line 121 called dependent, which is the where you can choose the metric that you're using. So in this case, they're using um, the normalized difference moisture index, NDMI. Um, and so if you wanted to use NDVI, you'd have to code in um, essentially adding NDVI as a band and renaming it to NDVI and then choosing NDVI as that dependent variable name. Um, so there's a little bit of um, 
kind of like heavy lifting on the back end you have to do to 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 use these other spectral metrics um, with the Fastnet Earth Engine. But if people are interested in doing that, um, happy to you know reach out um, if you're having issues with that um, and implementing it. So yeah. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Hannah. And with that, uh, wonderful, uh, Jamin and, and, and Hannah both, uh, thank you so much for the presentations and for answering thoroughly all of the questions that were uh, submitted by the participants. I also want to thank all the participants for, we understand that we're a little bit over the hour, so thank you for uh, your flexibility in staying on and your interest as well in, in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, going through the question and answer session. As we wrap up, I would like to give uh, Jamin and Hannah an opportunity for any closing thoughts or comments. Maybe Jamin, we can start with you. Sure. Thanks, Sean. Um, thanks, Selwyn. Thanks, everyone on the RSET team for organizing this and the other uh, parts of the training. To the audience members, um, thanks so much for your great questions today and for sitting um, sitting with us as we go through uh, this these different kinds of applications for monitoring refugee settlement establishment and expansion um, from a kind of infrastructure and population perspective. Um, next Tuesday, part three continues of the training, and there we'll be looking more at the vegetation side of things. We'll be documenting um, instances of uh, degradation. We'll be looking at uh, different ways we can study uh, agricultural condition um, in refugee settlements. So related, but uh, really an extension and going more, uh, more um, focused into the vegetative domain. So I hope you'll attend um, um, next Tuesday and then next week, a week from today, next week, Thursday, we'll be looking at um, measuring uh, climate exposure in refugee camps using um, Google Earth Engine again, but through a Python Colab interface. So really looking forward to that. And I just want to thank everyone again, um, especially Hannah for, uh, for their work pulling this together. Great, thank you so much, Damon. And Hannah, do you have any uh, closing comments for or thoughts for our participants? Um, just echoing Jamin's uh, sentiments. Yeah, thank you all for participating and to the RSET team for helping us host this. Um, and yeah, feel free to email Jamin or myself um, with any follow-up questions um, that come up um, now or in the future. Thank you so much. Great, and we also want to acknowledge the RSET team. That's uh, you might not hear them, but they are in the background uh, working tirelessly to make this training possible. That's Brock Blevins, Selwyn Hudson Odoi, Jonathan O'Brien, and Sarah Cutshaw. So thank you for all the RSET team, and especially big thanks to Hannah and Jamin uh, for providing such an amazing webinar. And we look forward to seeing everybody next Tuesday. So do stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you then. Bye bye.